Okay, so we're ready to start. Nice to see so many people. I see some names. You know. Welcome to the um, FEMAC studio. And um, um, we're in about what happened the last three days. We had this format, the FEMAC studio, and it was a three day, uh, really short uh, three day design studio. And um, when we and um, this ordinary architecture project that was invited um, were trying with the students to challenge existing power structure in the built environment and we were trying to learn new design tools and i think that's something we as femark were doing in other projects we did before like maybe some of yeah here <laughs> Some of you know them, the F Talks, where we invited at UDK for lecture series um, uh, women that have different special practice. And we also did the F Podcast um, work in progress thing, where we visited um, special practitioners, I would say, and interviewed them. And one of them was uh, Zoe Partington and Charles Boyd that are here tonight. And um, what? So the students that took part to the workshop are here as well. And to organize a bit, or like to let you know what, how is it gonna work? Uh, we will have a small input from just boys, and then afterwards the students will present a bit what they've been doing, and then we will really like to open the discussion. Um, in a bigger round. So please, at the end, feel welcome to talk and turn the camera on. Yeah. And yeah, I think just uh, you could start if you like to. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'd really like to thank um, Femark for inviting us, for inviting the Disordinary Architecture Project. That's me and Zoe, who are the co-founders of it. Naomi Lackmeyer uh, and Liz Crow, who are disabled artists who work with uh, disorder sometimes. So if I can share my presentation with you. Um, I may go through parts of it quite quickly because I think that it's uh, maybe a bit long for, because it would be really good to spend time on some of the other aspects. Um, but you can always go back and look at the slides, I hope. So. This came, this was a presentation that I do in various forms in different places, but I think the workshop for me was really uh, enjoyable and really interesting in the discussions and the depths of discussions that we had. And I think there are three concepts that I want to just pull out tonight uh, that were discussed, but also maybe we went through quite quickly. So the first of these is the idea of embodied practice. The second is critical access and the third is collective care. But before I talk about those, I just need to give you a little bit of background to the Disordinary Architecture Project, which Zoe and I started in 2008. And uh, it came out of Zoe's enormous experience in this field as a disabled person, but also as somebody who was part of a very vibrant and still vibrant disability arts movement and disability activist movement in the United Kingdom. And it felt like a really interesting way to bring disability and impairment into architectural education and practice in a very different way. And so right from the start, we developed this uh, mission statement, which is that we promote activity that develops and captures models of new practice for the built environment, led by the creativity and experiences of disabled artists. And for me, that's really vital because when access and inclusion, disability, uh, are normally and conventionally taught in architecture and undertaken in practice. These sorts of diagrams, the kind of technical diagrams of um, categories of disability, mainly wheelchair users, are the kind of the data that we work with. And that seems to me to be an incredibly limited way to think about um, the diversity and, and uh, richness of disability as well as ability. So the thing about the Disordinary Architecture Project is we start from somewhere very different, which is from the creativity of disabled artists from, from an incredibly rich um, engagement with the built environment, but which is through art practice, 
which is through things like crip humor and uh, a kind of burlesque in some cases, in others very rich, like Naomi, who we looked at, uh, whose work she showed our, her work, um, a very rich creative practice. And from my point of view, as somebody who's an academic and is able to do research in this field as part of my day job, um, I've written a couple of books. And I think for me, these, I'm quoting from myself, but this to me summarizes what I think we're trying to do. What's the problem? Disability as a concept and disabled people as a constituency continue to be assumed as completely separate from social and cultural politics. Disability is invisible in both avant-garde and mainstream architectural theories and discourses, just as it is in a persistent absence in critical and cultural theory more generally. It seems that we assume disability to be unable to have any, bring any kind of criticality or creativity to the discipline of architecture. So what we're trying to do and what we do in a lot of our events and in our other work, uh, in our workshops, is uh, see what that looks like, what it looks like if disability actually brings crit criticality and creativity to architecture. So those three concepts that I mentioned right at the beginning, first of all, embedded practice. One of the key things for me is that to really unravel, to investigate what normal bodies are, not just in the world out there, but within architectural practice and education. What is it that you bring with your body, with your identity, to the act of being an architect and being a professional? Uh, what kinds of bodies, how much is that a body that's valued and designed for in, in the built environment or who or what is left out in those processes? And finally, what can we learn by paying attention to the knowledge and experiences of diverse disabled people? That is from uh, body variety and difference. How might we start from difference rather than start from norms, assumptions or stereotypes? And for me, that means, and I come to this as the token non-disabled person and the token architect in the Disordinary Architecture Project. For me, and that, because I'm the one speaking here, I'm really interested in what, you know, in allyship, in what it is that I need to do as a non-disabled person to really pay attention to and engage with uh, the variety of uh, disability and impairment. So uh, I'm really interested in what, what are kind of ideal body types? Um, what, what sorts of person are you meant to be to be an architect? What, what kind of, what, is, what does that look like? And we had a discussion, we had several discussions actually with the fantastic participants in the workshop about that. And um, here are a list of, of words uh, of the kinds of things that come up when I ask those questions of architectural students and practic practitioners. Um, there's always an idea that you're obsessive, that you don't need to sleep, that you're very, um, you're very on it, uh, you're very confident. There are all sorts of characteristics that are kind of, you learn to be in the process of studying architecture. And at the same time, we have a series of stereotypes and binary oppositions to those characteristics, which is what it's like if you're disabled. It's what it assumed you're like if you're disabled. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is both those things are problematic. Ability and disability and how they get understood are things that really need to be unpicked. They're related to each other. They form this bond, um, which we really need to break. So that means that for people who are not disabled, we really need to face our own ableism. Uh, I, uh, a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normacy, intelligence, and excellence. So that connects not just uh, disability, but it connects it with gender, connects it with sexuality, it connects it with race, with class, with all the different ways that we assume certain characteristics to be valued and others to be of much less value. And I, one of the things I'm really interested in is how we might just move beyond that and not be kind of constantly trying to even redefine those terms, but start a whole new language 
of, uh, of things that really matter in the design of the built environment that move us beyond stereotypes. And I think interdependence is one, recognizing all our different vulnerabilities is another, knowing that this is all very complicated is another. So part of paying attention to kind of our own, and I say our own, anybody in a non-disabled category to the kind of unconscious bias and privilege that we have in that place, um, it's up to us to, to begin to ask these questions. Uh, and I don't have answers, but I think asking the questions is really how this whole area will move forward in a much more creative and energizing way. One of the uh, ways we, uh, I'm suggesting we shift language, which we have used with Disordinary, is the idea of fit and misfit. So instead of having disabled people and non-disabled people, what we have is something that's much more relational. We think about situations where we fit quite smoothly. We think about situations where we misfit. And this is something I would say that almost everybody shares. The amount of misfitting may be really small, or it may be that there was a lot of ways that you didn't fit as a child because you didn't behave like a typical boy or a typical girl, for example and you've worked or you've negotiated that in some way. Um, but generally, I think the kind of idea behind this ordinary architecture is if you fit, that means you actually operate in the world very smoothly. And if you think about what problems you have in the built environment and with others relationally, and the really you can't think of any, they don't come up immediately then you're actually really lucky and really privileged if you have that kind of smooth relationship. But also, I would say you lack some of the tools for real creativity because you don't need to take notice of your surroundings. You have an unproblematic place in the world and everything's just there as it is. But if you have a non-normative body, uh, lots of things will be frustrating and awkward. You'll feel that misfitting, you'll feel the discomfort that brings. But at the same time, you develop a real creative negotiation of built space and of other people. And you pay attention to and you negotiate places and social encounters in a very sophisticated way. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that misfitting can be a real value to a designer and that we recommend building on those uh, misfitting qualities and characteristics and circumstances as a design tool, something that will help you really think about uh, a much more, a much wider variety of ways of being in the world and ways that people need to use built space and enjoy being in built space. Um, uh, my second point was this notion of critical access. Uh, that's a term, uh, there's a whole movement in the States called critical access studies, which is really by uh, within a field called disability studies, which is incredibly uh, vibrant again area, but which never really seems to impact very much on architecture and built environment, which is a real pity. And the thing about critical access is it's trying to, to move us beyond those, those diagrams I was showing you of um, you know, the technical solutions to a, uh, 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 an access problem. So we need to get beyond those binaries of who's normal and who is special needs. We need also to really design creatively for uh, a much wider range of ways of being in the world and of um, fitting with that world. And finally, uh, and this is the big ask, uh, but it comes from disability studies, both scholars and activists, is how can we move beyond designing for access and inclusion, which is the language we use, at least in the UK, and towards something much more, uh, much stronger, because it's concerned with equality, and that is social material and spatial justice. So once you start thinking about spatial justice, your role as an architect becomes uh, much more complicated, I think. Um, 
So just to follow that up a bit more, uh, if I talked about misfit and misfit in terms of an embodied practice, for me, in terms of at critical access, what we need to do is really uh, build up a much better understanding of why we are where we are now. Um, why is it that somehow we've gotten to the position where we see disabilities as fixed, a historical non-theoretical category that's in this binary opposition to ability? How come we've got into a situation where we design for normal people uh, and then we retrofit those spaces for the, with add-ons for the people who we've left out in the first place? And we do that with technical and regulatory solutions. And by doing that, we don't have to apply our design brain, our imagination. We can do it very superficially. We don't have to engage with disability and disabled people as, a, as something that has a history, that has a culture. We don't need to understand why we have the regulations that we have, where they came from, what are the problems in them, how they're a particular social construction, not just a set of neutral guidance. And it means we don't ever have to take notice of the considerable expertise that disabled people have. We need to unpick that a lot more. We need to really understand a lot more about why we've got into this position. And there are increasingly histories that are covering this, again, in a really rich way, but again, that are not, um, not being taught in architectural schools or in other built environment situations. So where do we go instead? Uh, it's been coming up a lot in the workshop. Um, I think that Disordinary Architecture Project has uh, the kind of two main things in terms of how you might work around disability and ability differently as a designer. And the first is that disability is not some problem to solve at the end of a design problem, but it's actually a creative generator. And that if you start from valuing our rich bio and neurodiversity, you actually start from something really interesting and energizing. If you start from finding ways to take notice of disabled people as diverse creative experts in negotiating the built environment, you start from something that's uh, very generative. And if you use this concept of the misfit, uh, other words for that are unruly bodies, non-compliant bodies. And if you find ways of starting from difference rather than uh, just your assumptions of kind of ordinary stereotypical people, then uh, that seems to me to be very exciting. And then the second aspect of that is that disability is a very powerful critique of what is normal. We're so used to doing things in a particular way. And as designers, we are... Um, you know, we are programmed to do some to do social good. We expect to do social good, but in terms of actually being able to analyze our own social assumptions, our own unconscious biases, our own the kind of preferences we get taught within the discipline, that's much harder. And I think uh, starting from difference and starting from disability is a really interesting way of breaching norms, of shifting norms, to subverting norms about what bodies and spaces do and how they do it. And I also think that it's a really good way of challenging uh, our everyday interactions with each other and how those come to frame disabled people differently and to value them less to non-disabled people. And then finally, and again, we've been talking about this in the workshop, that means also looking at the way that architecture and built environment subjects are taught can we see what kinds of patterns of inclusion and exclusion uh, happen through that process? What sorts of bodies get valued? What sorts of subjects get taught? How the design process, what the assumptions are built into the design process and really uh, critique those things, have ways of um, opening them up at least to discussion. I just wanted to give some examples of both these things. Uh, in terms of a creative generator, you can find all these videos on our website and our Vimeo channel. Um, we've done over the last few years, uh, through UK Arts Council funding, we've done a whole series of interventions in architecture, interior architecture, building environment schools. 
uh, where artists work, collaborate with a tutor to develop um, projects, mainly foundational projects. I don't necessarily mean just at foundation level. I mean that they're foundational in how you think about these issues. Um, so uh, Rachel Gadsden, who's one of the artists who work with us a lot, she's, uh, she does a lot of large performative and narrative type work. Um, and this was at the University of Brighton where uh, the student's brief was done through, they developed their response to the brief immediately through very large um, mapping activities. This is David in um, Copenhagen uh, where he explores how rather than thinking of bodies as either being better or worse, and if you're disabled and he has a prosthetic leg, so people either think he's a cyborg and like extra special, or they think he, they feel sorry for him, pity for him. And he says the thing about having a prosthetic leg is it's just different. It affects your body. It affects the way that you move. And in, for him, it, it, has, it informs his creativity. So he asks people to uh, operate not only by changing their own bodies, but changing bodies in groups and then using that as a way of uh, developing new kinds of drawing methods. Uh, and then this is Liz Crow, who should have talked, but unfortunately was too ill, working with students at the University of Westminster in London, where uh, on a project called Tilted Horizons, with the idea that uh, for a lot of people who have chronic illnesses, you're always uh, scanning your the spaces to see if the places you can sit down, lean against, lie down, places for rest. We're trying to hack the real world to find places to rest. You may also find that you're not allowed to do it, that you get told off. And so this project with Tilted Horizons was about finding places to rest. And it was also about how you, what happens to how you design if you're looking at the world from a different angle. I'm going to talk about that one. And actually, I'm not going to talk about this one. This is a project we did, but time is short. Uh, I also want to mention we're not, of course, Disordinary Architecture Project is by no way the only group working in this field. This is a project by somebody called Sophie Handler. Uh, uh, with a, She runs something called Aging Facilities. And it was done with old people in East London. It's called the Resistant Seating Project. And she worked with uh, individuals to map where they found places to sit down in the built environment. And then with them, she designed something that enabled that to be a more comfortable experience. So this was Sophie's, uh, sorry, Sybil's uh, bollard where Sybil often sat, rested on this bollard. And together they designed a cushion that she could carry around so that when she sat on this bollard, she would be much more comfortable. And you can see it's a, it's a kind of the, the drawing is done in this very uh, formal architectural way of the Boulevard. It's a kind of running joke through the whole project. One of the things that we've looked at quite a lot is different ways of thinking about bodies and representing them in architectural drawings and, and others. This is um, Thomas Carpentier, who takes these kind of ergonomic drawings and then he works with um, uh, fictional characters, some fictional, some not, uh, the Borg Queen, uh, and he did his diploma project uh, at, um, in Paris was for a house where all, all these people lived together. Uh, and you can see at the bottom of that picture, I hope that's their dining table, which is kind of customized precisely to all these different kinds of bodies. And then he developed that into a really sophisticated project, exploring what that might look like as a built space. This is um, a student from Spain, just, uh, just taking seriously the fact that bodies change and uh, just having a figure in her uh, draw in her project, which was a, uh, a more normal kind of female figure than the average ergonomic character or the non-existent stereotypical placeholder. And this is a project by Greg Morrell at Newcastle University in the UK. He was really, this was a diploma project also. He was really interested in queering space, but then he really got into the idea of cripping space. And so he wanted to develop figures that he could use in his drawings 
that expressed that characteristic, um, that showed through the making of that and reminded him at all times that that's what was so relevant to the design of the project. And then some examples of being a critique of what is normal. I just wanted to give a couple of examples of those. Um, this again is a, a part of our a series of doing uh, workshops into architecture schools, rather like this one, but this is a, a, a deaf artist called Aaron Williamson working at the Architectural Association in London on a project called um, Disrupting Behaviours. And the students uh, uh, in a unit run by um, uh, manager Eva Gassi. And the students' uh, design work was not typical design projects. It was exploratory around all sorts of aspects of how architecture happens. So that's, this is uh, one of the final projects, which I won't talk about. And then another one that I think that Zoe and I, together with Mandy Redrose Rowe, a blind theatre producer and writer, have been doing now, we're into our third year, is called Architecture Beyond Sight. So this, I think, really does challenge the normal of architectural education and practice. Uh, this is a shot from the original development workshop where um, the Dean of the Bartlett School at UCL, uh, who commissioned it, worked with us, um, with a large number of blind and visually impaired artists and with a blind architect from Portugal to um, design a course, that a foundation course for blind and visually impaired people to become architects. And the idea of that course really was, is not just that it opens the way to have a much, to have a much wider range of people coming into architecture, but that it very deliberately challenges um, how the assumption that architecture is a very visual discipline, that you have to have perfect sight or you have to have good sight to be able to do it, and that it represents the world often almost entirely visually. It doesn't. Drawings don't represent smell. They don't represent touch. All sorts of things get left out in, uh, in once they get reproduced in that form. So uh, this is, and, and that meant really thinking about different kinds of design methods and how those design methods might be used more widely. We've done that this week in that with, um, uh, through the activity that Zoe led, um, uh, we're really interested in if you could design a building by describing it in words. So we're really interested in how words are, uh, having to describe something means you actually have to look really, really hard. Uh, Carlos here, Carlos Pierre, the blind architect, he uses everything from ways of cutting and, and folding card to Lego to making tactile kind of marks or stitches on trace. Um, so we developed a lot of those different ideas. Uh, we haven't run it this year because of the pandemic, but last year we had 18 blind, uh, blind and visually impaired students who made uh, a whole variety of different work. This is one of we had two tutors, two guest tutors, one a blind architect from America called Chris Downey, uh, and one a blind craftsman from Tasmania called Duncan Murding. Um, and so it was entirely led by blind and partially sighted people, uh, for blind and partially sighted people, which for the participants was a fantastic experience. Rachel Gadsden again, doing these large performative works, um, and here we have Mandy Redwoods Rowe, who's very uh, important in the development of it, working with an architect called uh, Shadi Abdul, um, just exploring how to describe a space using Lego. And in their case, uh, they did a design project together and uh, did it, explained it to everybody else entirely through performance and audio description. And it was completely believable and we were all imagining it in our heads. And then this is Duncan Murding with various students uh, in the workshop, making, um, teaching students to use power tools with confidence and making these wooden boxes on a, called a, box, a box of feelings. And again, these are some of the pieces. So this is foundation level with one, uh, an intensive one week study course. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the most interesting thing is the work was exactly what we expected and what you would expect at foundation level. 
And for a lot of the people who saw it, the design tutors, the workshop staff who were fantastic, they couldn't believe it. They kept saying it's so conceptually strong. They assumed it was just going to be kind of technically copying something that already existed. They, they couldn't. They, were, they had such a stereotype of the creativity of blind and visually impaired people. So what's my final point? My final point is about this notion of collective care. Um, and this one, I think it, it's come up, it came up in the discussions, but it's kind of the most difficult. It's the one that's hardest to think about and hardest to do uh, without being you know, in the lucky position that I am to be a researcher in this field. But it is about how we can really shift our notion of access from this binary opposition and this um, simplistic design solution. So first of all, I think there's a huge amount of really fantastic work out there, very relevant to our discipline in disability arts, activism and scholarship. And the big problem is it's not easy, it's not easily accessible. It's there, the, um, but it needs, uh, I was gonna say translation, it's not even that, it just needs to be something that becomes part of the norm of architectural education and practice that one can access that in easy ways. I think the second thing is thinking about what it means to understand access and inclusion as a collective endeavor, by which I mean it's not a technical thing. Uh, and that collective endeavor means all of us, just as Black Lives Matter needs white allies who recognize that it's an issue that they have also to take a stance on. I would say the same with disability politics and with uh, uh, spatial justice for disabled people, it's something we all share some responsibility for, particularly if we work in architecture. We may not have much power or control over it because some of it, a lot of it is our clients, but it is something we should be aware of and not just kind of push to the side. And then the final thing is if you break this pattern of having a binary opposition where you design for normal people and then you retrofit with these uh, technical gadgets that somehow seem to make it all all right. If you don't do that, if you see it as a much more fluid, a much more complex, contradictory situation where there'll never be an ideal space that works for everybody, that there's just too much difference. That's within a single impairment. That's not even across impairments or between able-bodied and non-disabled you know, disabled people. And so we have to understand critical access and collective care as something that's emergent, as partial, as something that really can only be dealt with through a kind of multimodal approach where you're building in a series of different ways, kind of layered ways of being able to occupy space that match the needs of as many people as possible. But that's going, at one level, that's going to be, that's tougher. It's, I'm asking something harder of you. But at another, what I'm saying is thinking about disability is just like thinking about any other design problem. That's how we design. We start with partial variables that often don't fit. And we try to use our creative imaginations to come to um, uh, better solutions. And that I think, uh, which just that we treat disability differently, which is weird. So for me, in terms of this, in terms of this notion of collective care, uh, there's a lot of interest in it. I think I'm increasingly being asked to talk around care uh, uh, rather than around disability. Um, there's a huge amount of really good work out there. I know that finding the time to read these things is, is tough. Um, unless, you know, it's your, you take a specialism, in it, but it is there and it is fantastic. And there's lots of resources on the Disordinary Architecture website. There are some amazing uh, disability activists. Um, this is the Disability Visibility Project in New York. Uh, Maya Mingus, Alice Wong and Sandy Ho. And they run this great project called Access is Love which I think is a really nice idea about access. Um, that's well worth looking at. 
Um, and it is really important, I think, to remember that disability activism underpins the kind of regulations that we have. They're not neutral. They were designed, uh, they were a response to uh, a really solid amount of campaigning, particularly in the States and um, the UK, but also across Europe by disabled people for human rights. Uh, this is um, a group from the original Shape Arts in the UK, for example. This is Bob Lozitsky, who has worked with us um, as part of one of her, her, campaign, her campaigning activities. And Zoe can talk about a bit more about this too. And this, uh, uh, because I don't know the European network so much, but if I look up disability arts uh, in the German speaking countries, I do, Nina uh, Müllermann is really interesting. She's the one sitting down in the chair. She does rather like um, Aaron Williamson, who was in the very first shot. She does these really fantastic burlesque works. Um, she's based, she's based in um, Zurich, I think. Uh, and then I just, uh, I know this is not a useful way to have it, but hopefully um, uh, we can put these in the chat. I'm sorry, I haven't done that yet. Uh, just by looking up disability, disabled artists, Germany, um, uh, I found some links to some really interesting work going on here. So um, that to me seems a really, you know, way I feel like the way that, we, that disordinary architecture does it. Uh, with disabled artists feels like a really powerful model and the possibility of bringing disabled artists into architecture schools uh, feels to me like a really good way forward. Uh, but there are lots of other things going on in this area in terms of collective care. This is somebody called Sarah Hendren, who just designed a whole in the States in Boston, designed a whole series of just uh, little ramps that made it easy for people to use wheelchairs or bicycles or, or buggies to get up and down curbs or little steps into shops just to increase access. And the reason I mention this around collective care is they did a project in Toronto where they just mapped all the places that those little ramps could be added in and the difference that it would make. Um, there's a woman also, uh, I don't know where she's based, but she's, she makes these ramps of Lego, little tiny ramps, little access ramps. They're fantastic, they just get you up a curb. Um, and they're, they're very brightly coloured, they're just a joy. So there's a kind of collective a care for the whole built environment and for making these small changes that add up to something. And then uh, Amy Hamray, who's a really important disability studies scholar, she runs a project called Mapping Access at the University of Vanderbilt, where they um, use crowdsourcing as a way of just understanding how the environment does or doesn't work for different people and building that up as a kind of layered map that isn't, it's full of rich data, doesn't tell you the answer because there may be, there's lots of contradictions in it, but it lets you understand what's going on. And, and crowdsourcing seems to me a really powerful tool in the contemporary world. Uh, and you can also look on her, on her website and see her critical design lab and see the kind of projects that they do, uh, often overlapping disability with sustainability in really interesting ways. And if, if you want to do more and hear more, then uh, she's giving a talk on, is it the 11th day, in a couple of days at um, Harvard University on this notion of critical access studies. And she's always uh, well worth listening to. Um, and I imagine this will be something that will also be streamed. Okay, I think I finished. I've just I wanted to end uh, on a series of um, examples of the kind of outputs that disordinary architecture produces, because in terms of this idea of collective care, I think a big thing for us is about how many gaps there are in the information that's available and that's usable within the built environment professions and within built environment education. But there's still this big gap of things that will help us all move this on and we just need to keep filling that gap. Thank you. Oh, I, I, <laughs> yes, I finished, thank you. Um, I, and I finished my final slide is the exhibition work that the students did, which I should just say uh, was really impressive and exciting and provocative. And hopefully they will um, uh, talk about that now.
Yes, thank you so much, Jos, for this input. I think it quite uh, gives an overview of our, all our conversation during the last three days. Um, so as I said earlier, I don't, I, I won't open the round right now, but um, I guess we would like to let the word to the student. Do you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, just um, maybe to give a little bit of a transition, um, because the workshop today was uh, in the last three days was uh, much more related to the current situation. Um, and also this format was much more related to the current situation <laughs> with every one of us being a little bit, yeah, experiencing a little discomfort um, and having, yeah, being forced to, to find new ways of using their environment. And so students were asked to reflect on this and um, all, the, all the projects and, and works are um, exhibited on the website. Um, and um, now uh, we are doing a small um, reflection round, I think, on, on what happened in the last three days. And we will give the word to Sarah. Hi. Um, I just quickly wanted to say uh, thank you to Joss and Liv. And um, I want to go back to the point of um, Joss just at the end when she was talking about um, accessibility of what we've talked about also in our workshop the last three days and that this needs to become more part of the norm in our architecture practice. And um, also about this notion about collective care. And um, in this workshop that we had the last three days was, um, we had a lot of very nice discussions and um, group talks um, and many also very inspiring um, things have been said. And we tried to now um, cut a few pieces of them together and reflect on them collectively. And uh, I managed to cut down 11.11 .11 minutes. And I think that's very fitting to the date. So I'm just going to show it. Um, but I also think that um, maybe afterwards it would be nice to um, talk about how um, can we make um, the approach that we've had during the last couple of days and the sensibility and, um, towards inclusion that we've managed to get um, maybe make it part more for everyone. And I think that's a question for also for everyone who's part of this talk today to um, reflect on it. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Actually really nice, like, I mean, just uh, tackling this, this uh, how to do an online workshop in these weird times. And I think it was a really creative way how to, how to do that with the website and how to do it with all this format. And, I'm sure there is like there's been like probably difficulties with uploading or downloading, but I think it was a really nice, nice approach. I enjoyed the um, um, thoughtfulness with which they discussed our project and discussed the topics with us. And I thought they were very um, it was a very nice space to have a discussion, which I think is very difficult online. And I think it's also because uh, FemArc managed this very smooth. Um, organization but there was really room for for thought and for doubts and for questions answered in very very interesting ways also because the, the theme is very rich but i really like the, the dynamic in the sense that um I, I felt that i managed to produce something even though it was not so much time and uh, and and still not being um i didn't feel under pressure and the fact that there was there was there was an interesting discussion on any input we we um, we brought into the conversation. There was there was a very nice um, there yeah, was a good dynamic. I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I think that like uh, this uh, workshop uh, created like a, a ground to explore and uh, express ourselves in a way which like. Uh, had a, a very common uh, background because we were all uh, in this particular situation and uh, it created like a, some sort of like a vocabularies of uh, how to create, a, uh, how to express these experiences, you know, of uh, like being on Zoom and stuff like that. And uh, I think it was really nice. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, I also totally agree um, on, um, 
Oh, I forgot what you said. Uh, on uh, the vocabulary, uh, right? Um, for me, it was a lot about learning uh, new expression, new vocabulary in on this topic, um, to put in also a lot of human love and value um, to um, this topic of spatial justice and um, the solidarity uh, that we are all missing, I think, in some ways or in many ways. Uh, in our practice um, and there's a lot to be done I think and yeah and it's also super cool I think how um, like with the like how people took the subject with such a humor like there are so many funny projects and this I really enjoyed like for today's presentation for me it was really um, working very well to somehow um, talk about two topics at the same time and um, um, relate uh, the broader topic about um, disabilities and uh, spatial practice to um, like, like to take it out of this big talk and um, focus on a design task that is then very specific and um, just produce something and uh, also see a bit where it goes without um, making it so huge all the time. And I think that helped really to um, work with uh, the topic. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think also that organization that just worked really, really well also having discussions and I had the feeling that every voice was kind of heard. And also, I think that's also because of the very positive and nice feedback we got and <laughs> okay yeah and actually it's very true um what Polly and sarah was were saying because it's funny how they would say in the right in the beginning that um like disabilities in architecture is very um structural or has like rules of how big a toilet should be for example or stuff like that and they, they told us that we, sh that we could see it as a creative uh, way, like a creative um, thing, you know, like to treat this like um, architecture for disabled people as a creative um, thing, you know, and I think it's really what happened, like with this not making such a big topic out of it, or just like maybe not such a big topic because I think it's a big topic, but it just like showed us a different way like to approach it maybe and that was great or, i mean like big is the wrong word but just like very personal or very subjective and that there's not just one solution but many and that's the great thing about it okay um so uh, what I was going to say was that I am very thankful for the experience and that it was really nice to expand the horizon a little bit further again. And uh, even just by so little things as taking a chair out for a walk. Um, but um, all in all, I feel like in this short amount of time, we had such a good also energy within the group and um, a very respectful way of discussion and talking to each other about each project, um, which also then led probably to that, that we learned so much within this short amount of time. Yeah, so thanks to everybody. And also I had the feeling that this was the first time since the uh, Corona started and all this online seminar started that it was really like a digital room that everybody talks and sees each other. Um, I, I don't know your experience, but until now it was always just like watching a video. It was not really a room. And I don't know what, what, what is the reason for that, but it worked out really well. And thank you, Mark team, for that. It was really nice. Um, yeah, I, I, if I can add something, the pro problem is that this, these, these kind of courses always remain as some sort of um, optional thing, you know, the, the, and, and of course in this sense it is never becoming, you know, the, exactly that step that you impose this problem or this, this 
whole aspects of planning as just as necessary uh, as um, statics or whatever. That that is what is missing, and this is this is that could be on the sh longer term somehow uh, communicated. So now check out the exhibition, <laughs> and maybe yeah, we can have a little discussion. The brief isn't there is um, the circumstances. Um, so yeah, the. I think the first assignment for the first day was to, to map and observe um, a new part of, of everyday interaction with, with your environment, meaning um, on being kind of locked into your private space much more and having to experience your environment and, and everyday um, tasks way different. And from that, your, your um, projects build on like how how can you, yeah, find a creative way of dealing with that? Maybe we can also, we should probably put up the, um, the exact brief um, to make it easier to follow, but there's a lot of different works from video, writing, graphics that you can click through on the website in the next forever. <laughs> but I think maybe it's also nice to, um read your quote that you started with i think it's maybe the katie lloyd thomas. actually yeah it's katie lloyd thomas quote um and we already worked with that um for the podcast when we were um looking for new ways of creating space and do you want to read out the <laughs> quote the i think we have to, to my daughter isn't very happy right now can you read it out maybe yeah, sure I sit alone at my drawing board, trying to design a building. There are memories of smells, the echoes between walls, texture, textures in my fingertips, raised voices arguing their case, quiet gestures of resistance, faces lit in an anticipation of possibilities. But my pencil can only draw the lines of habit. Lines, more lines, on white, until the configuration resembles other drawings of buildings I have seen. It is ready to be built, but all I see are the omissions. No history, no location, no corporality, no contestation between the geometries. Can there be another place to begin? Um, I have the design task. I can read it for, uh, out loud. For this task, we ask you to carefully observe and record some detailed aspect of your new everyday life. This could be conducting a meeting, going to the shop, meeting others in or out of your home. The choice is up to you. Find inventive ways of describing the extra and or different work involved, relational, physical, cognitive, emotional, exploring pleasures as well as frustrations. Then from this initial mapping, we ask you to create a short piece that picks to new possibilities. So I think that gives kind of an overview of uh, what the works were uh, working with. I don't know, I would like maybe to thank everyone, all the participants for the super nice conversation. Thank Joss, Zoe, Noemi, and our thought that uh, we, uh, and what's Liz, and I don't know, like, is there any question um, from the audience? Maybe we can turn camera on. It would be nice to have a, yeah, some, that'd be nice. see some faces behind okay. the names. And also we had kind of two, like, of course, one, um, one stream of thoughts we could um, follow is, and we can follow is like ask um, Jules and Zoe, who is mm -hmm. also here, Zoe Partington, hello. Um, about more about their work and about just presentation and the other, one um, that the little video um, of the student participants closed with is the, the I, I just the, our wish to in, in integrate um, more diverse perspectives into our curriculums and into our design um, learning, learning design, design education, and how we could um, achieve that. That's the big topic. Hmm. Yeah, and <laughs> what helps. <laughs> to get there, to get closer. Yeah.
Yeah, you can also write in the chat. Could you maybe share hey. again? Yo. Yeah. Can I say something? But I question it's more like a remark, and I think it's also um, jump, like reacting on what you were talking about, just about retrofitting, that designing um, solution or technical solutions um, to include disability in our spaces is always something, or very often something that comes at the very end. And uh, maybe we can link that to the fact, to what Ocean just said about our curriculums, that, I mean, we were mostly, not only, but I think, a lot of master students in this workshop, uh, maybe because at this time of our studies we have more freedom to choose our classes, or I don't know. But it also it comes very late. I mean, obviously we will keep on learning, huh? and it's not finished. But um, then this is also it is retrofitting already in a lot of conception that we've been building for the past five, seven years, or I don't know. And I think. Um, I think maybe also the next uh, FEMARC workshop could be uh, something with the very young or maybe not so young, but the first semester is like to directly tackle this uh, right at the source. But, yeah. I, yeah, I think that's a really important point. And it is, I mean, I don't know, again, it's different in different countries, but it seems to be really general, which is there's a kind of understanding in design culture and education that uh, having to think about disabled people as well as everybody else is like too much to do at an undergraduate level. It might uh, make you not be creative. It might make you less creative. And I've had that said to me by tutors that they don't want to discuss these subjects because uh, they think it will uh, reduce, it will be, uh, you'll all, everybody will feel they've got to be, you know, politically correct and they won't learn to be good designers. So there's, it's really, it's so built in to the system. And one of the things that's been really great about working with the Disordinary Architecture Project and having funding to work into architecture schools is it has come from tutors. It's come from students too, but, and tutors. Um, but a lot of what we do is people at the undergraduate level, you know, the level saying, we really want to be talking about this now. And so uh, I, I completely agree with that. And it's not, and it's also not like heavyweight. People think you're going to be like, oh God, you know, you're going to be hit over the head with this and we've got to take it terribly seriously because it's so, you know, Zoe was talking yesterday about fun because it's, it's actually very energizing. It's fun it builds into a design that when you're beginning really easily. I mean, so yeah, it's just, we, we work on the basis that we just keep making a noise about it. And then um, student groups, student societies or tutors come to us and say, we'd really like to have some of this. And I think, it's finding those people, you know, I think that's one route and I don't know, I don't know your, um, I don't know the, you know, the, the staff well enough or the tutors, but I think it's finding the, it's finding people or finding a group of students who are willing to kind of, well, like FEMARC are doing, not just with this, but in terms of the range of activities that we're doing, that are kind of willing, that, that want to explore these issues. I think that's how, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think it's a great point that it's like fun and creative and like important. I think it's also so important up to the point that it's also healthy maybe for um, first year students to learn about this because like one thing that we talked about a lot was this just this body mind awareness that uh, also with being an architecture student there comes also a certain like it's not only a mindset but it's also like it has a uh, it's a bodily experience that you do, for example, that like you stay up late and things like that. And I think, as you said, uh, Pizza Max, I think it's great that if we start learning about this as, um, as first year students, then we also have the possibility to refuse these things. And yeah. like this, yeah, I think it's a great point. Yeah. I think um, as well, just to, I've got my mic on, haven't I? Um, and just to reiterate, I mean, one of the things is, um, which is, a, is another bigger issue, is about the representation of disabled people 
within those curriculums. So your tutors, your lecturers, other students. Um, none of this should be mysterious or hidden away, I don't think. Yeah. And this is one of the issues. And also that if it is mysterious and hidden away, when you talk about it, specialist advisors come in and talk about it, not regular disabled people that pop to the pub, go clubbing, want to do all these other things. And it, it you know, just want to go to work. They don't just want to climb Kathmandu or all these things that have these expectations of being superheroes. We just want to do regular stuff like pop to the local store. And I think it's all those things as well that it's, uh, um, it's made into this special thing and it shouldn't be special. It just should be about equal rights, equal opportunities um, and sharing, sharing how we all live in the world. Absolutely. And I think speaking, you know, from the non-disabled perspective, I also think that there's an extraordinary amount you, you, you learn if you don't know disabled people or you don't have an impairment yourself, it's very easy to learn a lot of fear and anxiety around it. And I'm usually often the first question I'm asked if I'm giving a talk is, you know, um, but I don't I don't know what to say to a disabled person. I don't know what I don't know how to behave. So there's a there's a kind of fear, a ridiculous fear, which is which is about us. It's about non-disabled people feeling anxious. It's kind of not the point. It's like it's not being able to recognize just what Joe Zoe said, which is disabled people in all their variety, just like everybody else. And that that kind of, that kind of freezing up and behaving oddly that, that us non-disabled people do is we're the problem. So we need to find ways of just seeing the person and not getting caught up in kind of worrying if we're going to say the wrong thing, not be politically I correct. I think as well, Joss, I think, I mean, what we found doing the work that we've done as well is that, um, you know, we'll work with, um, we've done projects where we say we work with 45 architects from different practices and we work with 45 disabled artists and we bring those people together because there is this issue, isn't there, where sometimes architects or the built environment sector thinks about um, you know, disabled people, they, they do not design get in the way, they make it not interesting or sexy or exciting or innovative. Um, but actually, when you bring disabled professionals together with disabled architects, we're all saying the same thing, but maybe in a different language, in a different way. But actually, if we begin to unpick it, we all want fantastic environments. We all want it to work. Um, but it's just trying to find those common those common, the common ground really, isn't it? To, to have those conversations. So um, it, it isn't that disabled people want everything to look like a, a hospital environment at all. You know, we want it to look fun. We want our homes to be lovely. You know, it's, we want those public spaces to be engaging, um, but we want them to work for disabled people as well and not exclude us really. I had a question. Where can I? Mm -hmm. So I was I was interested because um, I made this commentary before. I didn't know it was going to be shown in this video, but um, to to go a bit further on that, I um, I was curious um, if you consider that this some sort of um, um, course or or workshop that that aims to sensibilize people should be part of the, the obligatory program, you know, architecture school, design schools, arts even maybe, I don't know. Um, because I, I think that there's, um, at the UDK we had some examples of, of um, this these courses, but but it's not, it's not really, I'm not sure it's reaching everyone. And um, yeah, I was curious if, if, if you have any ideas how this could be, because I'm not sure that this, of course, some some part of, um, of how you how you um, whatever you you can learn what are what are the um, um, uh, necessary you know how you make ramps how you make a building uh, accessible for um, um, different kind of people but uh, but um, but what I'm curious about is if, if this this sensibilization could be process uh, could be part of the um, Obligatory pro uh, program, and if there are any examples of this, 
for example, in the UK? Um, I can answer that first. I think Zoe will have things to say since she's just given a talk in the UK to the Royal Institute of British Architects and, and it was a bit depressing. Um, the it's funny because I think there's been there's been attempts to do that in the UK uh, from a government level since the Paralympics in 2012, because the Paralympics seem to show that uh, that disabled people were, you know, that that attitudes could change, that attitudes had changed, that the games were very popular. Um, it wasn't just disabled people watching disabled people. Uh, but the, the institutions that manage those things in the UK, the RIBA, um, they are very stuck in this idea of disability and the regulations and a whole framework we already have where you have these specialists, again, as Zoe said, you have these access consultants. And so you have a lot of people in a discipline who are often very good but who are, their job is to fill the gaps in what architects do at the end, the retrofitting, that's their job. And so there's a whole discipline of people who get paid to do that. Uh, and I, many of those people are very good, I like them, but they in a way stop it being possible or a part of it, it becomes harder to say, could we do it a different way as well? because we already have this, these assumptions are so strong and so fixed that it's really hard to get people to shift them. And so what we do comes over as being very, very and threatening, I think. I don't know, Zoe, would you add to that from your... Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, weird. I, I mean, I think, yes, you're right. These things should be in every course even at kindergarten level, you know, I, my philosophy is disabled people should be having these conversations, experts and proper training and development at a really young age so that it's not, you know, some disabled people, you know, in the past, not so much now, but it's still quite difficult, are sent off to special schools, sent off to other environments so they're not part of our society. Um, in the UK, people go off in you know, they, it's, you know, it's the, the special bus. So they go off to the special school with the special bus. Um, so you're separating people at a very, very early stage um, in their lives. And, and that shouldn't be happening. We should be having much more conversations at a very early level. But the issue is when you look around is um, there are very few very visible disabled teachers within any of our institutions at every single level. Um, so those role models for disabled people aren't there, but those role models aren't there for able-bodied people either. And I think this is where it really does need to shift a lot. I mean, I've been working with people in Philadelphia in America that are really now looking, you know, they look at gender issues, they look at race issues within school environments and with in sixth forms and within the university settings. Um, but they've not really looked at disability studies in the same way. And in Philadelphia, they're starting to do that. So they talk about disability culture and disability heritage within schools and they're developing a program. Um, and I think it needs to be there because I think the other thing is non-disabled people have delivered um, these programs and these lectures and built them into the curriculum. So that I think the reality, the real issues that affect disabled people are not, are not there and are not discussed. They're sort of, um, they're hidden away still. Um, and there's this other thing that happens called, and I talked about it the other day, internalized ableism. So even disabled people um, will, will replicate and will continue some of the myths that non-disabled people create around guidance and information. And because they think that's what we should be doing. And I think that's a huge issue to be able to challenge and look at that in a very different way. And um, and I wish I could answer that question and say, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's happening here in the UK across all our institutions. But I mean, Joss knows this. Sadly, it's not, is it, Joss, at all? Uh, 
I just wanted to add one thing to this because I think that just to come back to the or to relate that to the German context a bit because I think it's very relevant. Like we might um, we all say like or what you just said is also like we we feel uncomfortable. We don't know really how to behave around people who have like obvious disabilities, and um, maybe we think yeah that's that's just normal that there are no disabled people in our. Um, university, for example, or like very few. But the thing that you said with the special schools is like that is really one thing, one discussion that is um, very acute in, in Germany as well, because there is a large resistance to opening up schools and make them inclusive. And what it does is, yeah, that's why we are here now that we, we don't really, um, that we have to have these discussions a lot more. And um, I think that would be, yeah, really important to to also be aware of this and to support that in the German context. Um, because once people are put on a special track, it's really hard for them to get out of that again. And so they end up in like workshops for disabled people and do like really poorly paid work. And that is even like considered, or like a lot of people think, oh, that's a nice thing. But when it's not actually, it just takes away a lot of possibilities um, from people. And I would just really wanted to stress that point again um, because I find it really important and I think that's so important and I do um, I mean as a sideline on that uh, one of the things that is very I never thought about it in terms of this ordinary architecture project which shows something about my ableism and that is uh, the work that the kind of the projects that we do provide a very safe space for people with impairments who are studying architecture or practicing it, who are tutors, mm -hmm. to tell us that. And of course, almost all those people have hidden disabilities. It's not something, and, and they can pass. And, uh, and it's quite a high proportion of people. I mean, it's like, you know, if, if every time we do something, one or two people pop up afterwards and say, you know, actually I'm visually impaired or I have multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. or, um, uh, and so another version of that, which is part of this rolling thing, is once once you get to architecture school or you get through and into architectural practice, if you have an impairment, it's really uh, difficult to disclose it. It's not a safe space. Again, I don't know quite the situation in Germany, but here the way that if you're a disabled student, you get it becomes very individual. It becomes very medical. It depends on what your doctor says is wrong with you, not what you say. It's about providing, again, it's retrofitting education for the special needs that you have. And um, people just don't disclose. So you have this hidden, you know, within any group, you have people who are already, there's already a mixture of people, but it's perpetuated that mm -hmm. if you're non-disabled, it doesn't occur to you. You don't think. It's probably, there's, you know, there's probably lots of people in this room with an impairment. and and. Um, so that for me is very interesting about how is there a way, you know, part of uh, what the discussion about having this as a more normalized subject within the discipline mm -hmm. is that itself will make it feel safer for people to um, uh, just for it to be normal to people and it not to affect your chance of getting taught properly, it not to affect your chance of getting a job. Um, so all those things Zoe's talking about from the early years, you know, that they're, they're still having, you know, just what you said, but then these waves into our own, into our own area. Uh, and I can't, I'm certainly not going to ask those people, you know, I'm not going to sort of say to them, oh, you should, oh, uh, you know, you have to tell people, you have to be, and, and actually quite often students do projects about that, about their own. Uh, in different ways uh, so and that's often the first time they've admitted to it and sometimes it relates to what Zoe said again uh, there was a student who in foundation that we worked with we worked with foundation at London Metropolitan University over several years um, there were plenty of students with who who actually did work around issues of mental health or dyslexia but this one student um, did work around her epilepsy, really beautiful creative work. And she said it was the first time she'd ever uh, exposed herself in that way to her friendship group or her peer group. 
And in fact, it, it was really powerful because that just became something that was part of the overall discussion. It didn't kind of pick her out as the kind of problem person. Um, but it took a huge amount of uh, confidence, you know, power in her to, to do it. I mean, it was a really big step that she took in that situation. Um, and that's asking a lot of people, and that's, that's from our ableism, that's not, you know, shouldn't be her fault or her problem. So. I really, I really liked how Naomi was just very natural in her presentation about like how she approached her being in, in, in you know, stuff also in this, these situations where she um, relies on assistance, like very obviously. She's the performance artist who, who, who made the first input um, for all the other people who don't know, Naomi, Lack, uh, Naomi Lackmaya. And um, when she just said like, well, yeah, we, we all need help at some point. And just to be more aware of this and just, and yeah. And just saying like, yeah, we, no one knows everything. We're all fragile in some ways. Um, not to say like, there is there are not, some, not to diminish the experience of other people, but just really to, to um, yeah, have a natural way of, of, of showing vulnerability to that, that be not something which, I would find very helpful in, in architecture um, as a profession in general. I think that's a lot more other levels now, um, but yeah. Are there more questions? Or thoughts? Or thoughts? I wanted to add up on that, uh, what you just said, Laura. Um, what I really liked about this experience that you both um, also gave us a feeling or you told us to make it about own perception or our own experience and I feel like we all know this situation where we feel like a misfit though we might be like in the normal term be a able person but um, I feel like we all have have this point that we can you know share and ex expose to um, make the world a better place and it must not just be the person in a wheelchair but this general feeling of being you know a misfit somehow and um, evolve the word normal eventually. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's the goal. We have a question from the chat, should I read it? Are there sources to turn to for a Sources to turn to, for example, of non ableist architecture. Um, because I wonder if there is any buildings that are inclusive by accident. Oh, um, in, yeah, sorry. Jules, you were saying that actually, this um, in order to 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 sell or um, mm. yes, sell accessibility and inclusion to um, your clients, that you there might be a way to to hide it, to just build it into, and not really talk about it a lot and um, I found that really interesting you also wrote a book about the whole thing which there is a link on a website and yeah yeah and I do I mean there's uh yeah there's the, the two books that I've done one is like I mean from the early days of disordinary it's just really beginning to work out the sorts of things that this way of working what it leads to so it's still, there's still lots of things missing, I think. And then the other one, which is a reader, is really trying to bring, uh, it's called Disability Space Architecture, a reader. It's trying to bring the work from disability studies, disability arts into, um, to be something that's very easy to access within architecture, just as there are readers about gender. You're, you know, it may be not be work that you're, or sexuality, it may not be work that, your tutor show you, but it's there, it's available. Um, so it's trying to make that crossover. Uh, it's really interesting that idea about whether a building can be inclusive by accident. I think, um, I think, oh God, I'm gonna say, I don't know. I, I might have to leave this to Zoe. Um, when I was, I was a co-founder of a feminist architecture practice in the 1980s called Matrix in London. And we often got asked, uh, what makes a feminist architecture? 
which is a different question, but it's kind of connected. So, and we always said, oh, it's to do with the process. We always, we like, it's not an aesthetic. There is not a feminist aesthetic. It's to do with how you operate. And I guess, and so there was an idea that was always, and that led to the question is, uh, are women in the way, not as women, you know, as a, uh, as a, and cultural uh, construction that you go through, does that mean that women design differently for men, for example? So another question. And the reason I start with that in my usual complicated way is my immediate answer to that is I have seen buildings that I think are really interesting related to inclusion, uh, but they're designed by people who are either themselves have an impairment or very often have impairment in the family. And so it's a very natural part of their life. It's just a normal part of their life. It's what they know. And there's a lovely um, house in Scotland called the Ramp House uh, by Macmillan. Chambers Macmillan. Uh, where it was a house they designed for themselves. They're, they're an architectural practice. They designed it for themselves um, and they have a disabled daughter and the way that they did it and the process they went through uh, was very beautiful. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, oh God, we've got a disabled daughter, we have to do this. It was, it was like a way of being that I thought was really lovely. And in a way, so it's not by accident, but it comes out of, um, just having more of that kind of solidarity, I guess. And I can think of other examples like that. So I think, uh, you know, again, it's this thing about embodied practice. If in your, if you have that embodiment, if you have that, you know, it, it, it helps. There's a guy in um, Australia called Anthony something, who has a practice called Bloxus, L-O-X-A-S. And um, uh, I always forget his surname because I call him as a joke, Anthony Bloxus. But he, uh, he's really interested in uh, neurodivergence, uh, not just um, autism, although he has an autistic son, but also mental health. And, and he designed a house for a client who had, um, who had a neurological condition, a uh, single client house. And again, it's, it's not accidentally inclusive, but somehow there's a kind of, it's not normal inclusion either. It's not like standard access. There's something very rich about, and slightly odd in, an, in a way I really love uh, about his design process and his projects. So Philippe, I'm not sure that's an answer, but um, I guess that's what I'd say. Oh, and Zoe's putting some useful, really useful things in the chat too. Yeah. And uh, me and um, I haven't had a chance to even tell Joss about this, but um, last year, was it last January? I think we went out to Armenia to train architects and designers in a, a sort of disordinary way. Um, and the um, one of the architecture students, well, one of the architects that was on that course also had set up um, a, um, a group of disabled people that were dancers to develop dance and disability in Armenia. Um, and they have now, uh, they're in the process of building and putting together a fully accessible art centre um, to really develop practice. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens with that building and how they've designed it. Um, and that, that was Narek, one of the students, well, participants that we worked with is all as opposed to Narek from British Council. Um, but it'd be great to know more about how they've applied the thinking to the designs. And I, I will, we'll get in contact with, with them and get some information on Disordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, the, sorry, I'm just, I, you see, I'm too old. And then I, I put an example about Tate Modern in London because I mean, that was a by accident thing in a way, but um, Tate Modern was uh, really an industrial building, wasn't it, Joss, in a way? Mm -hmm. um, 
and but they've used um, the turbine hall, the huge hall in the centre of the building. Um, there is a huge ramp into that building, which wasn't designed for disabled people, but the disabled people that we've worked with have said it's so fantastic because it's a space where, say, if you're in your chair, you can your wheelchair, you can go really fast, or on your scooter, you can go really fast, and it's just nice to play in that space. Um, and it, it it's it would be good if that was in more buildings. I think the way that they've developed that in that space. But again, that was an accident. Yeah, now that's a really good example of an accident. Mm -hmm. I think because it's very usable in a variety of ways and in kind of. Uh, I and think I really like Guggenheim is probably the same, isn't it? Same sort of thing. That wasn't built for disabled people. Yeah, I've never seen anybody in a wheelchair, not that I go to the Guggenheim very often, but I've never seen anybody in a wheelchair scoot round that ramp in the way that I've seen people who use wheelchairs romping down the ramp at Tate Modern. <laughs> <clears throat> you also mentioned Arakara and Gins, and, and I have put in Claude Perron. So I think we're quite interested in in architects who, so neither of those uh, architects are interested in inclusion. So they're kind of accidental inclusion and sometimes they're kind of back to front inclusion. I don't know if you know Arakara and Gins, but the, um, uh, what's the thing about destiny? They have this project about um, irreplaceable, but destiny, no, it's something like that, which is, they basically have this whole storyline, which is if you design a house that's really complicated to get in and out of and around, then you'll live forever because you'll never, you'll always stay fit and young because it's always challenging you. And it's a kind of conceptual, obviously it's a kind of a conceptual joke, but it's very, uh, it's kind of the opposite of what we're saying, but somehow it's really rich in its ideas. And similarly with Claude Perrant and all his ideas about the oblique and about sitting at an angle and having, um, these kind of very different ways of designing physical space. I don't think then neither of those are sort of inclusive people, but they have a richness and a kind of eye to thinking about built space differently that I think is very relevant to what the kinds of in examples that we're interested in. We talk a lot about REMS now and I, I, I wonder, um, and I also love Claude Perron, and uh, the oblique, and then I wonder if someone is visually impaired, they would have a really hard time using the same space that is accessible for someone with mobility issues. And um, that's a whole nother level. Um, maybe, yeah, or like, no, just, just to not forget, and Zoe has definitely um, told us in the workshop as well, for example, not just to use visual content, but to do audio description. And I wonder how to, how, yeah, where can we go? Because ramps, we can, we know, oh, there is, should be, yeah, how to build them. There is literature on that. But what else, what other elements and um, for the yeah, range? Of I think, ramps. I mean, there was, I think one of the things, I mean, when I did this talk for the Royal Institute of British Architects, um, I, I felt I felt a little bit like I was in a glass bubble because 20 or 30 years ago, guidance was developed, you know, on ramps, sensory access, all these things that we talk about that are very functional. Um, but people are still talking about it now. And I'm thinking, surely we've moved to a higher level on all of this. And those discussions should be around um, how those things are embedded within everything. So the texture, wayfinding, all these things they work for everyone as well, not just for disabled people. So I think it's really important, isn't it, to think about that. Um, they should be there. But this this idea of spaces and engaging spaces and those spaces for everyone and different things can happen in those spaces. I, I just felt with this talk that I had a few weeks ago that we should be talking about that. That should be more about central to, which is what Joss talks about a lot as well. Um, and what a lot of people have talked about, the participants over the last three days about thinking or reflecting on these spaces um and i i mean i mean me and joss we try and avoid guidance don't we in a way joss because yeah. it sometimes it blocks thinking so people look at guidance and think oh right okay so i put the guidance in and that will work 
but sometimes actually no one's actually evaluated and I've talked about this before evaluated and monitored and asked disabled people and other people whether that functional guidance and stuff that's there does it work is it useful does it does it make your you know <laughs> your your journey through that space more exciting or that time that you're in the space and it can be such simple things like the lighting and the way the materials reflect the lighting and that that can be the same for everybody i think um but when you have sensory overload on another level it can affect you much much faster than it affects everybody else mm -hmm. yeah and i do i just like to add i think that's all really important and i'd just like to add i think the thing about using you know using claude pearl as a reference is not to say oh you should do ramps it's to say here's somebody who's thinking about the levels of a space in a different way and i think i mean zoe and i both had the pleasure of going to the Yokohama um, um, ferry terminal together uh, um, by, I'm sure you can all tell me who that's by. Uh, Foreign Office. Thank you, <laughs> Foreign Office of Arctic. Um, and, you know, again, it's got these kind of rolling surfaces. You might well think it's something that's not really suitable for a, uh, a visually impaired person, like, you know, for the access needs of Zoe, but, it has these really beautiful handrails that define the space where it begins to, to um, roll up. And uh, we both really liked it for, for different reasons, I think. Um, and I think what was really interesting in Tokyo, we went to see a gallery that was purpose built for blind or partially sighted people. And again, had beautiful door handles, beautiful handrails. Um, a huge flight of steps up to the front door and suddenly yeah. well you couldn't be visually impaired in a wheelchair user for a start but uh, it was for some reason that was completely missed wasn't it Joss because they were looking at one group of people and not everybody yeah yeah um so I do I think it's um I guess one of the things we're both interested in because of this thing about it being connected to beauty uh, and not clinical is where there are really good examples. You know, they may not be good inclusive examples, but where there's details or sets of relationships in a space that are really gorgeous um, and that feel like they could be very enjoyed by everybody. And that, so it not being about meeting a, an access need, although it needs to meet those needs, but it being about how one can play in that space and yeah. occupy that space in a variety of ways and the Rolex um, in the Rolex Learning Center again <laughs> sorry will tell me who that one's by um, there uh, uh, Sanya uh, is uh, there's a really good piece about that building in um, in the reader book uh, mm -hmm. by an architect called uh, Kent Fitzsimmons which is about how they designed that particular set of relationships in the space of this kind of rolling landscape mm -hmm and then were pushed into putting kind of access ramps into it and other requirements for different functional categories of disability. And that in fact, the space itself, by having ways of um, using it differently, depending on what you wanted from it, uh, across a range of really different um, abilities and disabilities, was already very rich and having to put in these artificial uh, regulatory elements yeah Just i think really showed the problem of thinking about disability yeah. that way i think um i just have to i know probably everybody's yeah very tired but um just a really funny story i don't, I don't know why it's happened in japan again but it has uh there were several things that happened in japan whilst i've been there we went out to audit in kawasaki city um their arenas uh for the for the gb for the great British, you know British teams to go out really um, and the heritage sites and the arena it was all in Kawasaki city and um, we went with a group of Japanese people um, to look at the arena because they'd had accessibility looked at they'd had an audit they'd started to change things but then they'd had disabled people go around and disabled people basically said no it doesn't work um, so myself and Barbara Siki who've seen some of the photos earlier on Joss's um, uh, talk um, went to a uh, to this arena, sports arena, and they showed us an accessible bathroom. 
And, and this is where you do have to have humour. Me and Barbara, we were just, we fell on the floor laughing so much because it was so inaccessible. We we're really not sure how anyone had ever designed this space in such a way. Um, and there was a huge concrete platform across the back of the room for the shower. So you had to climb up a huge step to actually get onto it. And Barbara just said, you know, it would be absolutely fine for an orgy because it was a big shower room, uh, but absolutely totally inaccessible to disabled people. And the um, the Japanese sign language, the Japanese interpreter was saying, I can't say that to all the guys that are here. Um, but eventually we cracked through and they did see the funny side and they began to understand what we were talking about. Um, and it is about analysing, evaluating and disabled people being involved as well. I, I think that's so important, um, which would you know really change things. But I mean, there's lots of examples all around the world, but there was there was quite some some lovely ones in Tokyo. Yeah. There's some fantastic stuff in Tokyo as well. I'm not, I'm not sort of criticizing them at all. Is that moving hands or just resting heads and hands? <laughs> See a lot of movement. Okay, do we have more questions? If not, um, it's, uh, yeah, I would really uh, want to thank all of you again for showing up here today, um, listening to Joe's lecture and hopefully looking um, at um, the projects that are on the website, on um, yeah the studio website, which we can post again. Oh, okay. Vincent is. Hi, no, I just wanted to thank uh, Joss and Zoe because I didn't have the opportunity to be part of the video. Um, but I'm not going to be not going to take too long. Um, I just really liked um, your uh, that we had the opportunity to do this workshop with you. So I thank um, Femark uh, for giving us this opportunity and uh, Joss and Zoe for participating because your your input was very important. Um, I'm always fascinated by the way, the different ways we can question uh, our ways of being, of operating in the world, whatever that may be. So I think that having this whole experience uh, taught us a lot and uh, will sure stick with uh, most of us um, for uh, the rest of our professional career, I hope. And the best compliment I can give is that uh, we talked about very serious uh, and important uh, subjects without even realizing it, because it is so such common sense um, that, um, that it, didn't be, it didn't even feel that hard to, to explain. It's so obvious, right? So I thank you very much for it, and uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Vermark, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah, one of the things which um, which you, you just mentioned is what Zoe talked in the podcast that we did with them before is also this once you start or once people start noticing, um, it's really hard for you to unnotice all the barriers or all the yeah all. How, how, how things are not accessible, how spaces are not accessible. And we hope that this workshop um, helps um, with, for us to yeah, keep on noticing um, the experience that other people have in, in spaces. And then I will again um, invite everyone to check out the projects on, on the website. We will also upload this um video on the website the stream didn't really work for i think connection reasons um we try to also put up the input so that yeah we just really try to create this space online so that also people who didn't participate in the workshop now have access um, to a lot mm -hmm. of the discussions and interests that um we had so yeah we hope that that works out and we're happy to get feedback to send us an email we want also to thank um, the, the Frauen, you know, the, that um, the Equality Fund, mm -hmm. yeah. who um, 
they gave us money to invite the Disordinary Architecture Project, Joe Zoe, Noemi Lakmaya, and Liz Crow, mm. and yeah, and all of you for your time. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.